I'm uh, David Scare, teach here at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And for the last few Sundays, uh, we have been doing the Sermon on the Mount, and we're coming to the last pericope in this series, certainly not the last pericope in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, if you've been following along the last few, uh, a few weeks and so forth, you'll, uh, you'll have seen that this is fairly turgid, intense material, somewhat exhausting to go through. Um, still, it's, um, these, the evangelists thought this to be the most significant words that Jesus had spoken in determining how the Christian community was going to live. And um, um, uh, just before we go any further, because I don't know if this is going to be, um, whether we're going to get, the series is going to get into Matthew until the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe it is. But there is a little bit of relief in chapter 6, uh, 25, where it says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. Or put on is not the life more than food. I love that particular passage because Jesus says, "Be uh, why are you concerned about what, what you're going to put on your, your body, your fetus, because you have the greater miracle in front of you, or which is yourself, that it is um, that it is the body." But let's take a look at verse 38 to 48, and we'll read it in English, and we're using the RSV. You have, heard it, you have heard that it was said, 6.38, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone uh, sue you, would sue you and take your coat, let him take your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to him who begs from you, and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you salute only your brethren, what more are you, going, you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. This, again, is a... Uh, is a section of the Gospels which is, is dense. And uh, before we go into the, uh, ex going to the, to the, through the verse-by-verse -verse explanation of it, <coughs> um, this seems to be, I mean, it certainly is arguable, or it seems to be arguable, uh, very clear that uh, this is an original word of Jesus. Um, from this viewpoint, He's not politically correct because he is speaking about people who do evil things are like the Gentiles. Uh, not a very nice thing to do. Uh, on the, from, a, from an interpretive point of view, I think this points to the originality of the gospel at a very early time um, because uh, Luke uh, removes, has no negative, does not have the negative materials about the Gentiles uh, that the Gospel of Matthew does. And so it seems maybe that uh, the Gospel of Matthew did not play in Peoria, certainly in the churches that Paul created. And so Luke creates a Gospel which is a little, a little easier to take. Now, um, uh, how are you going to interpret how are you going to interpret an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Um, some commentators look upon that in this sense 
that if somebody does an evil against us, we cannot take anything more than what we lost. I'm not so sure that's the intent of these particular words. And um, again, it's metaphorical language, because this was really never done. And, and this helps us understand the pericope for last Sunday about taking out your eye and cutting off your leg and your foot. No one, ever, no one actually did it. And certainly, if I damage another person's eye, and that can happen in an automobile accident, and it's, it, it was not intentional, that that person then doesn't require that my eye be taken. This is really a section here on retribution. And when we speak about retribution, we're speaking about the atonement. See, what is the principle that I should not take retribution? Behind the, behind, well, that's, that's reconciliation. We discussed that in a previous section, in a previous section, how the Christian is not to go and uh, he's not to be angry with his brother. He shouldn't be looking uh, for an equal payment. And this is metaphorical language, obviously metaphorical language. And the person who uses the picturesque, the preacher who uses the metaphorical uh, language, uh, is more likely to keep the attention of the congregation. Now here it comes. Uh, the tooth for the tooth, the eye for the eye, is explained in verse 39. Do not resist the one who is evil, but if he strikes you, turn the other cheek also. And if he would sue you, take your coat, let him take your cloak as well. And he forces you to go one mile. <laughs> now, uh, Here again, the, what is behind these words are the principle. And that is, the Christians, where this really comes up, is in the Corinthian congregation, where the members are suing one another. And um, they're suing one another. They're going to civil courts in order to get retribution for uh, for wrongdoings and for alleged wrongdoings. And St. Paul argues this way. You're going to be judges in the next world and you cannot solve this difficulty. And um, if, you want to, if you're willing to engage in that kind of sermon, good luck. And that is we live in a very litigious society. In fact, what's here is expressed in a metaphor is a description of uh, what this life is all about. A former president of this institution would jokingly say, I'll be suing you. And so that everything would be taken to court. Why? So that I get what is due to me. You have walked across my property. You have disturbed my property. Uh, you have ruined my car. Uh, you have made me feel bad. My child has not uh, got the education that he or she really deserves or which he's entitled to, so I will sue you. So the courts are, the courts are a bitter business, uh, uh, got, got a big business. And what I find kind of interesting is this one. <clears throat> if someone wants to take your coat, if someone wants to take uh, a coat, let them, have, let them have your cloak. Well, to, t to give the guy the coat you'd have to first take off the cloak. Now Luke turns that around. So he says, if anybody wants your cloak, give them your coat too. It's, it's much more natural. If you're going to take this coat, OK, I'll give you the coat. And uh, then I can proceed to take off my shirt and give it to you. Matthew has it this way. First you take off your shirt, but to, then you give the coat. But to take off your shirt, you have to give the cloak. I find that to be, I find uh, I find that to be kind of uh, evident, uh, evidence of how Luke looks at the same material in a different way. Yes, if anybody wants your coat, give them your shirt also, and ask to him, O Greg's. Now. Uh, 
this is a this is a real issue for this reason at least it happens to me at least once a year that in the parking lot at our church a person will come up and uh, ask for money so I say come on into the church and we'll we'll will handle your problem. Oh, no, I go to whatever it is, the salvation. Oh, come on in. We'll get something for you. And inevitably, he won't come in. This is panhandling. Now, begging has become a professional art. If you uh, go down to the southern border of the United States, there are people who actually bring their children with them in order. It's a scam. That's what it is. Uh, th this does not approve of such scams. That's a business. But uh, panhandling is a business, and they do very well financially. That's not the point. The point is here that the, we are to help the person who is in need. Last Sunday, we heard in our church of a case where a pastor, um, I won't say where it was. That wouldn't be fair. But they discovered that his parsonage was, had, had lead, lead paint, and there was lead poisoning, possible lead poisoning with his children. And that uh, the family had to have all their furniture and things destroyed. They lost it, the things that they owned, because of the possibility of, of it was that actually tested. That's what it means. It means that what we have, we are to share with those people who are in need. That's the meaning of the past. It doesn't mean that everybody who pretends to be, uh, uh, to, be, to be begging. In the ancient world, by the way, the beggars were real. Um, I think if you go to one of the countries in the Far East, you will notice the huge gap between the rich and the poor. It is pathetic. When we tend to read the scriptures from our own middle-class values here in America. And that is where the, there, uh, we, we live our existence in such a way is that there is this huge middle class. And we think that's the way the rest of the world is. There are, well, we know that for a fact, that there are people in Cuba who make a couple of dollars a day. We know in India there is extreme poverty. In the Islamic countries, there is extreme poverty. And that is against, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, and in Luke he says, blessed are the poor, he was speaking against, a, a, he was speaking within a context of a society in which the rich lived in their own world and the poor lived in their own world. And that was a case where east is east and west is west. Now, the Christian church has gone a long way into uh, alleviating that situation. But that's not the issue here. The issue here is that a lot of people with very, with acceptable salaries get themselves in jams and that uh, we, are, we are to come to their aid. And in verse 43, if we can put that up a little bit more, <coughs> Now we come to the really sensitive issue where a lot of people are going to take exception. 43, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It's very difficult to determine. You see the word X run there. It's very difficult to determine what, who Jesus is, whom Jesus is quoting. There's no reference there that anybody was taught to hate your enemy. Maybe that's just the assumption of human nature that we dislike those who are not with us. Now, here comes the whole thrust of the Christian religion. And that's in verse 44. Contrary, yeah, contrary to what is just the I say to you. Boy, those are strong words. That's, <laughs> that's the best words of verbal inspiration ever. I say to you, he doesn't quote, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now that takes us back to the Beatitudes, in which right after the 
Blessed are those who are persecuted on account of righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted, the eighth beatitude. It's referring to a general condition of the church in which the world is attacking it. And at least in the United States, it didn't seem a generation or two ago that the church would ever be persecuted. But the church is now being persecuted, certainly on the grounds of political correct speech of what we are allowed to say, about what we are allowed to say about behaviors that, uh, that we, don't, we do not find acceptable. Well, we, are, we are being persecuted in the sense that in certain places our preaching in public is disallowed. And uh, so the, there is a persecution of the church going on. And what is amazing here is the use of the second person plural, you. In the English, we don't, you, it's hard to distinguish the plural from the singular. Here you got the plural, pros, au, ex there, which points to, which points to this, that we are not speaking of private prayer, but we are pre speaking of pr corporate prayer, prayer which is used in a congregation. And these prayers are being offered up in behalf, e pair, for the benefit of the persecutors, not the persecuted, but those who are the, those who are doing the persecution. That's really an unusual. The Christian ethic is so unusual. Now, what is the reason for that? The answer is this: that God has no enemies because the atonement has been offered up for everybody. The atonement has not simply been offered up for believers, but for everybody. And so sometimes it's been taught, and falsely so, that faith is a cause of God's good favor to us. That God loves those who have believed. True. But he also loves those who do not believe. What God asks of us right there, pray in behalf of the persecuted, he himself also does. The Son, Jesus Christ, comes before the Father and prays not only for believers, but for those who do not believe. And then comes the next verse, 45. It might be the best, one of the best passages in the entire Bible. When you do this, when you do this, thus you will be the sons of your father, of your father in the heavens. I absolutely love that passage. For this reason, this looks like the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in the heavens. You will be the reason that you will be the sons of your father because in praying for the persecuted, you are doing exactly what God is doing. And because you are doing the things that God does, you will be recognized as his sons. That's what it means. It doesn't say you will become the sons of your father by the very act that you're doing it, but you will be recognized as the sons of God because you have the same attitude to your enemies that God has to his enemies. And what's the evidence? Now, this is a good nature religion. And why not? You know, you can see people, people that you don't go to church because they're finding God out in nature. Isn't that great? Good. Okay, but what's the proof? Here we have this word, ano tole, the rising. The rising. The, we mentioned that the word, the, the land of Turkey is called ano tole, the land where the sun rises. For the sun, Helion, over there, Heliopolis, the city of the sun, when it rises, it rises on evil people and good people. And it rains on just and unjust. I just love this. I absolutely love this. The, 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 the mere fact, it's always, a, it's, all, it's always a problem for us, by the way, 
to explain how a good God allows catastrophes to happen. That a good God would not do that. Okay, but that's not the point. The point is that in 99.999% of the time, the world goes along according to a prescribed form. And you know it yourself that the, even though we had a lovely fall, warmer than usual, the winter was inevitable. And it is cold out here beyond expectations here in the middle of December. Very cold. But this is the way it goes. And it can also be expected that sometime in March and April, the weather is going to ameliorate and we'll get warm. Now, this is what the passage says. That God, God by letting the world continue as, it, as he has, this is an expression of his love. And when he, in these expressions of his love, he does not distinguish between I, who am a believer, and you, who are not a believer. He does not distinguish between people who are good or bad. He is merciful to all people. So what we own or what we do not own does not indicate his, his love of us. The, the mere fact that the world continues, I don't care how bad the day has been, you will get in your car and you will go home. You will find your way home and you can expect certain things to happen. Now, it won't happen absolutely in the, without a hitch because that's just the nature of the world that we live in. And when it speaks about the evil one, poneros, right there, this is the word that is used in the end of the Lord's Prayer. Deliver us from the panera. That's satanic. So these are people who, they're not simply bad people. These are not simply people who don't go to church. These are not people who are occasionally, you know, not doing exactly what, what should be expected. These are people who are in league with Satan. These are people who are under the, if we don't want to say that, these are the people who are, who are under the influence of Satan. These are the people, the good people, are those people who are under the influence of God. These are the people whom God considers to be just. And these are the people who, from our point of view, are unjust. God does Okay, God is politically correct. God, let's say, no, let's not say that. Let's say God does not discriminate in giving good gifts. He does not discriminate based upon what we do. And now, he now comes the typical point, and it will be difficult for every pastor in his congregation. Okay, he says, uh, a good friend of mine was told he was going to get a Christmas raise. Very substantial. And uh, so um, he told his boss, my, you're really a great guy. Only to discuss he had to produce something like $25,000 in sales. Now this is the way, the, as soon as you step out into the world, you have there the ethic of the world. If you love those who love you, you already have your reward, which means one hand washes the other. It means that people who are in business, every deal is based upon that the person getting the deal has all, in some way, who is doing the favor, that the person is going to do the favor in return. That's the way it goes, tit for tat. There is nothing for free. If they give you whatever, whatever fries they give you at the department store for buying something, you've earned it. That's this, that is the ethic of the world. Now, <laughs> I see no reason why a, a, a sermon can be based on that. And Jesus says here, if your existence is based upon simply helping those who are going to help, help you in return, you're like the tax collector. Now, that's an amazing statement because it speaks about graft. If Matthew is the author of this, and I think all the evidence points to this, he was a tax collector. So he knows what he is talking. 
if I only do a favor to you because you do a favor to me, then I'm, a, I'm just like the rest of the world. I am a pagan. When, and of course, it, when I'm, I'm speaking now during the Christmas period, and you'll be preaching on this long after Christmas is gone. But Christmas presents, the sharing of Christmas presents, is based on this, that one person reciprocates in receiving a gift by giving another gift to, to the person. That's the way it goes. Now, Jesus condemns this. He doesn't say it's, 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 uh, give it up. He's saying if you're doing this, you're not doing anything which is specifically is a Christian thing to do. What it, what it means is, what he wants to say, we are to do good to those who are not able to return the favor. We are, that, that, that's, this, this is the radical Christian ethic. And I think it can be preached quite, quite forth, forthrightly. And, um, and then the next one, by the way, every pastor faces this problem. Right here. How do you get people in the, in the congregation to greet other people when they come to the church? I see it. I go to a church in the summertime. And, and, and it's good. It's very good. Sunday after church, people sit down and have a coffee hour. And I think that's absolutely great. I always like the coffee hour. In fact, that's kind of what the church is for me. I kind of like it. But the people say, sit with the same people that they were sitting the last week. And they do need it, especially older people. They need the social contact. That's what the church is for, to provide this, uh, this fellowship. Not only a spiritual fellowship, but a social fellowship. However... There is a higher ethic and that we go out of our way to speak to other people. And uh, here, by the way, the world is much more advanced than we are because the man who is getting, who is, who is getting ahead in business, he's going, if it's a salesman, department store, bank, He's going to go around and say hello to as many people as he can. It's an amazing thing that those who are not Christian are using a Christian ethic uh, to advance their cause. Jesus says that's exactly what we are to do. <laughs> we are, if, oh, by the way, he, does, he says if all we do is greet the people we like, we're no different than the pagans, the ethnic coy. That means the unbelievers, the people who do not know the God of Israel. And then comes the last passage. Now this is an absolutely great passage. You will therefore, therefore, you will therefore you be perfect as the Father of you in the heavens is perfect. Now let's take this apart. Here again is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, uh, the Heavenly Father. Our Father who, who art in heaven, here it's your Father, the Heavenly One. Now notice this. This is an indicative. It's not a, an imperative. It's a description of what you will be. You will be, you right here, notice that the word, you don't need the word you here, but it's there. The word therefore kind of accentuates it. You will be perfect as in heaven. Now the way this passage is frequently preached is that this is law. That we are to be perfect like God, but we can't be perfect like God. No, no, no. So we're not perfect like God, so Jesus. But that's not what it says. The word perfect comes from the word telawo, which means Complete or goal. You will be complete just as your Father in the heavens is complete. And that means this. God is not going, going around taking retribution against people, whether they go to be. He isn't. God is no collector of taxes. He's not going around saying, because you did this, I'm going to do this to you. No, no, not at all. That is not the case. God is. God is perfectly content. I like the phrase from the poet, I don't know who it is, God's in the heavens all right with the world. I don't know if that's Shelley or who, 
That since God, he is perfectly content. And what this says here, the Christians will be content. They'll be content whether they are slandered, whether they, whether, no matter what they do. And by, please remember again from the previous sessions that we are, that the, this particular gospel is written to a church which is under persecution, and the persecuted people are not to take retribution against those who are taking, who are doing the, uh, who are carrying out the evil things against them. It doesn't say that. And this is not law, not law at all. This is a description of what God is and what the person who is in Christ. I absolutely love this passage because it is descriptive of what God is in himself and what we Christians are as in God. You have a lot of materials to work with. Um, I love the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you want to, as I have mentioned before, if you want to see what I have to say about this uh, more extensively, I think CPH is still carrying this book, The Sermon on the Mount, the church's uh, first statement of the gospel. And um, you see, the, the temptation here in preaching this is to uh, preach everything that's in this particular pericope and then going on for more than 20 minutes. Well, you're not going to win any friends uh, by that approach. Uh, the, I think it would be a good idea to take some of this material and continue it in the Bible class. Thank you very much. I wish you the very best and hope we can do this again.